Happy Easter. And to my brothers and sisters in Christ, he is risen. Indeed, he is risen. Well, it's so good to be here with you again. You may have noticed over the last month, if you're tracking with us here on, online, with these sermon messages that I've been tag-teaming with uh, my fellow worker, Pastor David, and I hope you've been blessed by his messages. I, I certainly have been. So today is Resurrection Sunday, and why don't we get right into our text for today, let's not waste any time, and get right into the meat and potatoes, per se. So please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we'll begin in verse 1 together. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve, verse 6, after that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, and all, then to all the apostles, and, the last, and last of all, he appeared to me also as one abnormally, abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church, the church of God. By the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed. Verse 12. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your preaching, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. Verse 16, For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. The Lord bless the reading of this word. Please join me in prayer. Father, we thank you. We thank you for Easter. As we've been uh, journeying and preparing for this uh, day, we just thank you as you have as you've paid, made us pay attention to your word and by your spirit have taught us so many things and revealed so many things about the meaning behind all of this resurrection and the, the Easter Sunday and all that it means to your people, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that uh, you sent your one and only Son in this world because you love the world, not to condemn the world, but to save the world. And we, we praise you for that, and we pray that you would be honored and glorified in this message today. Father, thank you for those who are watching or listening to this message. May they be blessed to know you. And Lord, if they do not or are not in that place right now, I pray, God, that by your spirit you'll be speaking to them and drawing them unto uh, your, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and granting them repentance. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, on Resurrection Sunday, it is appropriate that we take some time and consider the doctrine of resurrection, which we find in the New Testament, and specifically as we just heard, as we read together 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now Paul's letter to the Corinthians was in response to information that had come his way while he was in Ephesus during his third missionary journey. And we know by Acts that it was during Paul's second missionary journey that he had spent approximately 18 months establishing the Corinthian church 
before moving on to other destinations. Now, some time has gone by, and Paul writes his letter to deal with some disturbing issues and concerns in the church at Corinth. Now, time, as I've often said during these messages, is not always on our side, and there is a rather long list of issues that Paul dealt with in his letter, so we just want to mention a few just to help us understand uh, what the lay of the land was in Paul's day. So one of the major issues was sexual immorality. And as you read through the letter, you'll notice that. Among a number of examples, one really stands out. Paul highlights one particular individual in the church who was living in a relationship with a stepmother. You'll find that in chapter 5 of this letter. And it's really interesting to note the context of this back in that day is that this kind of sexual morality would also have shocked and horrified the pagans as well. Just to try to throw that in, just as an interesting note. Another major issue concerned uh, the visions in the church. We see this in many of the early churches, but it was happening here in Corinth. Various factions had cropped up, and Paul pointed this out when he said, My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household inform me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Apollo. Another, I follow uh, Paul, another I follow Cephas, still another I follow Christ. You find that in the first chapter of this letter. So these factions were quarreling in the church. But there was another issue Paul's addressed that we can see. There are other issues, pardon me, that Paul, Paul addressed. But we can see very, very clearly that it didn't take long that at, when Paul left the Corinthian church, the trouble began to arrive in the church. There should be no illusion in our minds that the early church was better uh, when compared to today's church. Paul's letter should burst that, that bubble. We just have to read Galatians and see what was going on there, or check out Paul's letter to, to Timothy, who was pastoring in Ephesus at that time, and even a lot of the events described in Acts. You know, if Easter reminds us of anything, folks, it should be that the only perfect one died sinless one died and was raised from the dead and today sits at the right hand of God interceding for his bride the church that's the people of God and it's because of Easter that Christ's bride the church is righteous and justified before a holy and just God it's good to be reminded of that at Easter but we have one issue here that happened was, was going on in the Corinthian church that we want to address today. And Paul makes reference to this in our text today in verse 12 when he said, But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Also notice and throughout these verses um, that Paul never mentioned once anything about these people denying the resurrection of the dead, denying the resurrection of Christ per se. It's interesting to note also, if you read through the New Testament letters, that the Corinthian church wasn't the only one dealing with a variant or a different view of the resurrection. As mentioned, Paul wrote two letters to his dear friend Timothy, who was pastoring in Ephesus, 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. And Timothy was dealing with error, division, and conflict, and more in the Ephesian church. And the primary cause of this dysfunction in the church occurred when false teachers had affected some in the church with their false teaching. Paul writes concerning these false teachers, and he said, concerning these teachers in Ephesus, their teaching will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenius and Philetus, who have departed from truth. They say that the resurrection has already taken place, and they destroy the faith of some. I hope you notice that this is a reversal of what was going on in Corinth. Corinth, they were saying that there is no resurrection from the the dead, for the dead. And here they were saying that the resurrection had already taken place. When we think about that, the question is how? How could this destroy someone's faith? So let's think through this together. So what if a loved one dies and that person was a believer? And someone came to you and said, convincingly, the resurrection of the dead has already happened. You've believed that what the apostles taught about the resurrection of the dead to come when Jesus returns, 
You look around and your loved one is nowhere to be found. Now you begin to question the truth. And maybe your doubt turns to bitterness. You think, I've been sold a bill of goods. You believed you would see your loved ones one day at the resurrection. And now you take the next step. And the gangrene has done its work. You depart from the truth. Now, if I said that this kind of gangrene, maybe from false teachers or empty human philosophy or other unbiblical teachings, has been, can be found in the church today, what would you say? Would you say yes or would you say no? Or would you say something else? As you ponder that, I want to introduce you to a person by the name of Alyssa Childers. Now, maybe none of us know who that is. Some of, of us uh, may know who Alyssa is, is, or maybe because of the kind of music and the style of Christian music we used to listen to in the late 1990s and early years of, 21, of the 21st century. Alyssa Childers is a former member of the all-female Christian rock and pop group uh, pop group, uh, sorry about that, Zoe Girl. But today, Alyssa, years after her music career, ministers in the area of Christian apologetics, uh, theology and culture, primarily via social media and blogging and, uh, and uh, podcasting. And I came across one of her blogs called Five Ways Progressive Christianity and New Age Spirituality Are Kind of the Same Thing. I caught, that really caught my attention, so I read the blog. It's not that long. And I found as I read through the material that what she describes in her blog concerning progressive Christianity and the evangelical church today was in many ways similar to what Paul was dealing with in the churches of his day, like our example here in Corinthians. Now, of course, again, we do not have the time to develop a clear and sound definition or foundation of under, an understanding of how far New Age teachings have come since the days of, say, Shirley MacLaine and her crystals, or her standing on the beach with her arms up in the sky saying, I am God, or Oprah, Oprah Winfrey learning how to move things with her mind through these spiritual gurus. Suffice it to say this, is that the New Age spirituality has been repackaged, rebranded, rebranded and has become very palatable and has found its way into the evangelical church, sadly. As mentioned, she, Alyssa provides five ways progressive Christianity and New Age spirituality are in some way the same thing. But we just don't have time for, to look at all of those, but let's look at a couple. The first one, she points, out that how, she points out how New Age spirituality can be identified, and that's by its relativism, relativism. Folks, this is the rejection of objective, moral, and absolute truth. And it goes something like this, just keep it really simple. If it feels good and right to you, well, it's right. If it feels real, it's real to you, it's reality. What happens, folks, is this makes you and me the authority of truth and reality. So one of the marks of today's progressive Christianity, or, or of progressive Christianity, period, is the denial of biblical authority. And Alyssa makes a great point, an excellent point, when she says this. Quote, No one operates without an authority. If you remove one authority, you will replace it with another. And friends, this is what progressive Christianity does. What they believe to be true is no longer based on the authority of the Bible, but from themselves. In essence, shifting the authority to what is true by becoming their own authority for all, moral, moral, all morality and truth. And if you think about this logically and reasonably to its final conclusions, they will just eventually continue to march or march by the drumbeat of the culture around them. So here's what I found as I've been studying this more than just this past week. I've been paying attention to these things, these changing shifts in uh, Christianity and in the world around us for a number of years. I found that progressive Christianity is hard to pin down. It's hard sometimes to detect that in any church or denomination, and even in a person, unless the leadership of a church or denomination or the person that is steeped in progressive Christianity is clear and upfront about it. Because, friends, it's common 
to be talking to a person who is a progressive Christian or a teacher in that movement that believes in the Trinity or believes in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ or believes in the work and the ministry of the Holy Spirit or all of them. And if you think about this clearly, doesn't this make perfect sense? Why would God's enemy, the enemy of every believer, show you his hands? Why would he put all his cards on the table for you and me to see? You see, Satan's intention is always, always to destroy your faith and my faith in God. And of course, the best tactical approach is to introduce lies via deception, via trickery. Think about it. After all, think about this. When the serpent said to Eve, you will be like God, knowing good and evil, Eve reasoned that the fruit did look good for, uh, did look good for food. It was pleasing to her eye, and it came with a uh, bonus, wisdom. Well, let's move along to the second uh, um, statement that Alyssa talks about concerning the biblical doctrine of the atonement. And she points out that New Age spirituality does accept Jesus, but denies the blood atonement, his blood atonement. New Age teachers and their followers consistently using Christian language when speaking. And this is part of the rebranding, the repackaging of something like New Age uh, spirituality. Jesus in the New Age Spirituality is an example of a person who has attained enlightenment uh, vis-a-vis the divine. Therefore, Jesus' death is not a saving act because salvation comes from within us. And Alyssa is clear to point out that it's no problem for a New Age believer to recite the Lord's Prayer while believing in the power of healing of crystals and karma, and those kinds of things. What this really is, is the denial of the atoning death of Christ and his resurrection. I alluded earlier that uh, not all progressive Christians would deny the blood atonement of Jesus. Yet there are a number of leaders in the movement who teach that Jesus did not die a substitutionary death for sin. A number of years ago, Uh, In the early 2000s, another movement started in the Christian circles called the Emerging Church or the Emergent Church. And Canadian pastor Tim Chalice points to Brian McLaren, who is one of the leaders of the Emergent Church movement today. And not only does McLaren deny what Paul said about the Bible in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God-breathed, he also denies the substitutionary atonement of Christ and even that Jesus is the only way to the Father, among other things. Now, as mentioned, McLaren is a leader in the emergent church movement, but many in the progressive Christian camp would be found in the same boat as McLaren. We think of some popular Christian um, musicians today who consider the idea of God requiring a blood sacrifice for sin as, Alyssa quotes, horrific. We have progressive Christian leader Rob Bell, who picked up on this view a number of years ago, more, maybe even more than a decade, decade ago, in his very popular book at the time, Love Wins. Bell, in his book, refers to the idea of a blood sacrifice as something that the early Christians, the early church, picked up from their surrounding culture, which they used to explain the death of Jesus. And Alyssa points to a 2016 lecture by Bell, who went on to ridicule the idea of the atonement when he said, quote, God is less grumpy because of Jesus. And Bell summarized the bread and cup of communion as an opportunity to, quote, heighten our senses to our bonds with our brothers and sisters in our shared community, end quote. I don't even know what that means. So in summation, for many progressive Christians, they have, they have added the saying, Cosmic child abuse to their theology. Well, let's go back to our text in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 
Here, Paul, in 19 verses, deals head on with those in the church denying the resurrection of the dead. And we can divide Paul's exhortations very simply. So verse 1 to 11, Paul restates his apostolic teaching concerning the resurrection of Christ. And then from verse 12 to 19, Paul refutes those denying the resurrection of the dead. So let's take a a few moments with verses 1 to 11. And we start by keeping two things in mind. First, Paul, as we remember, spent 18 months with the church in Corinth. He's the one that established it and planted it. So he'd be familiar with the people in the church, or at least some of them. He would be familiar with the setting and the surrounding culture. Also, Paul was writing to Christians in this letter, not pagans. So it's no wonder that Paul begins verse 1 with, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you. And Paul also reminds the Corinthian church that they had received his gospel and had taken their stand on it. And furthermore, it is by this gospel that the Corinthians, Paul would say, are saved. That's in verse 2. We go to Paul's Roman letter for commentary on this. And there, Paul reminds us that the gospel is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. It's the very same gospel that would save the Corinthian believers. But Paul adds an if. An if. If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. This is Paul's obvious direct response to those proclaiming something other than the gospel of Christ in Corinth. Then we go to verse 3 and 4, and what we have here is is just a wonderful, wonderful statement by Paul. A clear gospel presentation, a clear, concise description. And we can paraphrase it this way. Christ died for our sins. Christ was buried. Christ was raised on the third day. Folks, this is the plain gospel. And I think if we think about all the other things that I've been talk, well, we've been talking about this morning, even our understanding of our culture, Christian culture today, any other gospel such as found in the progressive church movement, the emergent church movement, every false gospel movement out there over all history that's ever been preached and taught doesn't, test, doesn't stand the test of time. Sooner than later, the proof becomes the pudding empty of any power to change the sinful heart and the mind of an unregenerated person. It's soon replaced with the newest, repacked and rebranded rebranded version. Gospel 9.0, Gospel 10.0, and so forth and so on. And Paul describes this in our text as in verse 14 here, he says, useless. Friends, it's hollow and it's absent of anything resembling faith in the resurrected Christ. Absolutely hollow and useless. We notice here that Paul begins his statement in verse 3 by saying, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first first importance. We go back to his, we go to his Galatian letter where Paul said to the church, I want you to know, (coughs) pardon me, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preach is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. That's the first chapter of Galatians. Paul didn't need to go to seminary. He didn't learn this in seminary. In a few statements prior, just just before he said this, Paul responds to the Galatians turning to a different gospel, to another gospel. And he says this, this is a very strong statement. Even if we, that is Paul and the apostles, or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. That is a very, very condemning and strong uh, statement. Back in our text in verse 11, Paul said, Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach. And this is what you believed. Question, who are the they Paul refers to here in this verse? The we. Well, the answer is found in verse 5 to 8. We, he tells us, Paul tells us that after the resurrection, Jesus appeared first to Cephas, 
an apostle, that's Peter, the apostle. Then he appeared to the disciples of Jesus. Then he also appeared about 500, more than 500, it says in the text, at the same time, most who were still living when Paul wrote this letter. Then he appeared to his, Jesus appeared to his brother James, who did not believe in Jesus until his resurrection. And then Jesus appeared to the apostles and finally to the apostle Paul. Here's the point, folks. Paul's gospel was given to him by Jesus. And it was the same gospel all the apostles preached. This, friends, is the foundation of the church. The apostles preaching and teaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Of his birth, of his death, of his resurrection, of his ascension. This is the foundation of the Christian church. Anything else is not Christian. And finally, to frame all of this in a biblical authority, Paul uses the phrase, according to the scriptures, twice. Once in verse 3, once in verse 4. And to those who deny the atoning work of Christ, who deny the resurrection of Christ and of the dead, when Jesus returns, the word of God simply says this, Christ died for our sins, Christ was buried, Christ was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. Next, Paul, in the last set of verses, 12 to 19, he turns his attention directly on those denying the resurrection of the dead. How can you say there is no resurrection? And if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. That's verse 12 and 13. Remember, we have already said that some progressive Christians believe that Jesus was raised, yet deny the authority of the Bible. Same kind of stuff was happening here in Corinth. They were not necessarily denying the resurrection of Christ, but they denied the resurrection of the dead. One commentator said about Paul's statement here, quote, Paul was saying you can't have it both ways. Paul was never so clear than here, folks. If the dead aren't raised, Jesus wasn't raised from the dead. This is what someone once called a both and or a neither or situation. If Jesus and believers do not experience resurrection from the dead, neither of them does. So if this is true, then the apostles would be, as Paul said correctly, false witnesses about God. And we, you and I, would be false witnesses about God. And think about it, the ramifications. Pentecost really didn't, ha really didn't happen. Peter preaching to the Jews on the day of Pentecost, waste of time. Paul's teaching in Romans, fiction. The Bible, just another book. Resurrection Sunday, well, at least bunnies are cute and chocolate, are, chocolate is yummy. And turkey and ham and scalloped potatoes are easier to swallow than some crazy story about the resurrection. And what about those who place their faith in Christ? Paul is very clear and to the point. It's useless. It's futile. If Christ was not raised, friends, you and I are still in our sins. And we, like the apostles and all who have come throughout the ages, believing in the resurrection, indeed are a people most to be pitied. But, but, Christ died for our sins. Christ was buried. Christ was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. Father, God, we thank you for your son. He is risen. Indeed, he is risen. Amen. Thank you so much for being, inviting me into your homes. God bless you. Shalom.